the comments. Um, I don't want to start a big abortion debate on this with the comments. I understand it's a controversial subject for a lot of people. For me, it's not controversial. It's, it's clear to me, my belief. But I realize some of you have some other beliefs. So I, I've asked God, I've been praying about this sincerely today to say, God, please, Jesus, help me to speak your truth. I don't want to speak anything false. And so I just, join, join me, let's just pray right now. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you that we have the opportunity, God, to go online at the time in the world when a lot of people don't want to meet indoors. I thank you for this opportunity to get the word out. And I pray that you touch us, open our hearts. Lord, I ask you, open my heart. Let me see total truth, God. And everybody who's watching, I pray that you would just touch their hearts, that they see to total truth, that we see your word as the truth that it is. I give you all the glory and I give you all the praise and I thank you, Lord, that this will be done in your love and in your word and in your truth. In Jesus' name, amen. So thanks for praying with me. We normally have a midweek Bible study at the well um, until the pandemic struck, of course. Now we meet at a neighboring church that has a big sanctuary, bigger sanctuary that we can spread out in because some people aren't comfortable coming indoors right now, which I understand. In warmer weather, we'll be back outdoors, and that'll be awesome. Sunday mornings, we do still try to go outdoors when we can. We have a heater out there. So Sunday morning, uh, we'll, we'll let you know if we'll be under the tent or whether we'll be indoors. Now, if you want a handout on what I'm about to teach, send me a message. I've already had one lady who wanted it, and I emailed it, two people who wanted it, and I sent the, um, it's a Word doc. I sent it to them via email, but I also took pictures of my document, and I put that in the comments of my earlier announcement about what, of what this Bible study would be about. I know it's hard for you to leave this right now to go find that, so, um, you know, if you want to take just 10 seconds or whatever to go see, I don't know if you can print that out or something, but there are four pages. So I have two pages back and front. I am going to try to finish this so that people can watch the rest of the inaugural events today. This subject is obviously, especially on Inauguration Day, I should say, a very touchy subject for a lot of people. I want you to know that even though I am pro-life, not pro-choice, I am anti-abortion, and I'm a radical one. I'm anti-abortion in any case. Just because we may disagree on this, I want you to know that I love you, and I hope you love me. I have... I have all kinds of friends who've had abortions. In high school, I hate to say this, it's terrible, but in high school it was just the thing to do, you know. Um, I had some friends who had several abortions. I didn't love them any less. Just because I disagree with abortion doesn't mean I love somebody less because they've had one. So I want you to know that just right up front. But I do believe that the Word of God shows that life begins at conception so that throws a whole new light as to the whole thing about the viability of the fetus as they call it i don't think we have to discuss the viability of the fetus i think we have to say the baby is alive at conception now the reason i felt to do this this week is that friday january 22nd marks the 48th anniversary of the historic decision in the United States, Roe v. Wade, which legalized abortion in this country. I think it's important that we, as Christians, learn more about this. Some people have never thought about it. I mean, I'm going to be blunt here. If somehow I had uh, been pregnant in high school days, I probably would have had an abortion. Even though I was going to church and called myself a Christian, nobody had ever talked about this subject to me. Nobody had ever taught me about it. Nobody had ever pulled out a Bible and said, here's what the Bible says about this. I just knew that people who were pregnant and didn't want to be pregnant, especially young girls, that they needed to just, you know, go on and get an abortion, I thought. Well, lack of information here, ignorance is what propelled me to that belief back then, which I obviously abandoned by the time I was 19. I became a really, truly strong born-again Christian 
and I saw the truth. So I think we need to get the, the word out biblically. Talk to your children. I'm going to have my children. If they're not watching this downstairs now, they're going to watch it. I'm going to read this scripture to start. Proverbs 24, 11 through 12 says this. Rescue those being led away to death. Hold back those staggering toward slaughter. If you say, but we knew nothing about this, does not he who weighs the heart perceive it? Does not he who guards your life know it? Will he not repay everyone according to what they have done? Now, this is not the King James Version. Some of these scriptures I will read will be possibly NIV or ESV. This one, Proverbs 24, 11 through 12, plainly says that we are to rescue those being led to death, those going towards slaughter. We're to stop it. And you, I know a lot of people would look at this and say, we're talking about like people who are already above ground, you know, out of the womb, so to speak, and breathing. I think this could apply also to the babe in the womb who was alive. Now, before we get into what the Bible says about it, let's talk about just some statistics. Statistics are hard to find. Like if you go type in and figure out statistics for 2020, it's hard to find them. A lot of the reputable institutes that keep these records, it takes them so long to compile the statistics that a lot of these I'm going to read, I'll tell you, will be 2017, 2018. Um, so globally, WHO, that's the acronym there for the World Health Organization, estimates 40 to 50 million abortions annually. 40 to 50 million. That's a huge number. Now, now granted, that's globally. Still, that's, that's a lot. Slightly under half of these are performed unsafely because a lot of countries still don't have laws that have legalized abortion, so they still do uh, very um, unsafe abortions. If you take the numbers that the World Health Organization gives us, that would be about 125,000 abortions daily. If you figure that up, just like every, just abortion, 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 that's how many we have going on. In the U.S., let's go with the different. Uh, stat keeper here, the CDC, Center for Disease Control, reported 619,591 abortions in 2018. That's in the U.S. I've told you the global number, so now we're to the U.S. There are other sites that say it's really higher than that, maybe 1.2 million annually in the U.S. That would be one every 20 seconds. It, just in the U.S., when I told you a minute ago that it was like that, we're talking globally. In the U.S., it would be about one every 20 seconds, 137 an hour, 3,288 abortions per day on average in the U.S. Now, if you go all the way back to 1973, when the law was passed, the U.S. Supreme Court legalized abortion through that court case, Roe v. Wade. If you take all of those years of abortions you would be just around the 60 million abortion mark in the U.S. I think the exact number they gave through 2019, and again, this is the CDC, some give higher numbers, was 59,902,500. In North Carolina, we have some stats from 2019. In this state, in that year, there were 28,450 abortions. Now, here's some good news. That was a 9% decline since 2009. So over a 10-year period, that was a 9% decline. I think that that's probably due, and this is me guessing, probably due to uh, better birth control, uh, ac more access to birth control, better access. We won't talk about who agrees with birth control for unmarried people or not. I don't know. That's a whole different issue. Sticking right here to simply abortion. So in North Carolina, there are about the ratio of abortions to live births is like one to five. For every five live births in North Carolina, there's one abortion. That, that's a pretty big ratio there. Now, to find the locations for abortions, um, I had to go back to 2013. So you're talking a, an eight-year-old statistic. It said that 1.4% of all abortions were done in hospitals and 986 
were done in non-hospital licensed facilities. At that time, in 2013, there were 17 of these non-hospital licensed facilities, which are primarily those freestanding abortion clinics. In 2017, there were 26 facilities providing abortion in North Carolina, and 14 of them were clinics. So that's changed a little bit from 2013. 14 of them clinics, but 26 total. This is a 13% decline since 2014. Back then, there were 37 abortion providing facilities in North Carolina, and 16 of them were clinics. So um, the number of places that you can get abortions in North Carolina has gone down substantially in the last few years. Now let's talk about the people who are getting the, the abortions. The 2013 averages, and this is in North Carolina alone, the average age of the woman getting the abortion was 26.5. She had an average of 13 years of education, 75.6% of these women were unmarried. So that tells you that, you know, a substantial percentage of these women were married and just decided no more children. 33.9% of the women in North Carolina who got abortions in 2013 were repeaters. They had already had abortions before. That's, that's over a third of the women going for abortions had already had abortions before. 60% of the women in North Carolina who got these abortions already had one or more living children. I think a lot of times we think that the people having abortions are just these young girls who've never had kids and we think if they only had kids they'd understand that they shouldn't do this. But you see that it says 60 percent of the women in North Carolina who got these abortions in 2013 had children, one or more. They've been through, they knew what motherhood was. So um, Maybe we should set some of those myths aside. It's not just young teenage girls here we're talking about. Briefly, let's talk about abortion methods. I'm not going to get into this a lot. Drugs are primarily used in the very early stages as opposed to surgical abortions, such as you know the vacuum aspiration. Um, so drugs primarily in the very early stages. If you're talking about um, some that maybe aren't as early, but they're still less than 15 weeks gestation, Surgical abortion is also common in these. Vacuum extraction is the most common. Um, it uses a manual syringe or an electric pump. Uh, I mean, I hate to say it, but it's basically that they're you know, sucking out the, the parts of the, of the baby. I'm gonna call it a baby, not a fetus. Now, another surgical method that's used in uh, babies that are less than 15 weeks gestation is a DNC. A lot of women know what that is. I had one when I had a miscarriage years ago. A DNC, dilation and curatage, they use um, a tool to go in and scrape the uterine walls with this tool to make sure they've gotten all the parts of the baby out. Now, if you go with a woman who's you know, getting along with the pregnancy, she's 15 to 26 weeks, 15 to 26 weeks of gestation for the baby, you gotta go to some other techniques dilation and evacuation. We've talked about a DNC. This is a DNE. They dilate the cervix to empty the uterus with surgical instruments and suction. Another method, especially if it's getting on further with the pregnancy, premature labor and delivery. They induce labor by drugs, probably the kind that a lot of women who go full term get their children induced by. Um, it often includes injecting saline solution into the amniotic fluid, which will kill the baby. Another method is intact dilation and extraction. It's called an IDX, intact dilation and extraction. It's also called an intrauterine cranial decompression. We know this as a partial birth abortion. And uh, I think if you really look at those terms, intrauterine cranial decompression, Cranial, that's your skull here. We're talking about decompression. You're, you're crushing the skull or you're doing something to the brain so that the baby is no longer alive in the uterus. Whereas a lot of these babies at this age, if you let them be delivered, they would live. You may have to do something to help prolong their lives here but or to help them live. But for some reason, people believe that if you go ahead and 
kill the baby inside the womb and then deliver it, it's not murder. But if you were to bring the baby out and then do it, perhaps they would call it murder. Uh, so again, that surgical decompression of a fetus's head before evacuation. Now, this was federally banned in 2011 in the U.S., but that was overturned. In North Carolina, the change in the law came in just 2019. Uh, before that, the law was, and I hope I get this right. If I don't, please forgive me and somebody give me a comment and help me. But before 2019, the law had been changed in North Carolina that you could not do one of these types of abortions or you couldn't do any abortion after 20 weeks. I think maybe unless there was a horrible circumstance to save the mother's life, I could be wrong on that. But in 2019, that was overturned. Our governor, Governor Cooper, actually vetoed a bill. I won't go into all the law, but he vetoed a bill that would have made these types of abortions n illegal in North Carolina. Like after a certain point, you wouldn't be able to do this. I think actually what he vetoed was a bill. I know what it was. Let me go back and rephrase that. There was a bill on the table that if a baby is born at a, one of these late gestation time periods and the baby's alive, like if it was trying to be aborted and it, then it came out and it was alive, people wanted the doctors, anti-abortion people, wanted the doctor to have to resuscitate it, to have to take care of the baby and not just let it lie there and struggle and die. But that bill did not pass because Governor Cooper vetoed it. So in North Carolina, it's no longer a felony if a doctor does an abortion and the baby somehow lives through it and the baby is out in the open and it was struggling to live. If the doctor just lets it die, that's no crime anymore in North Carolina. Now, the final thing about this, from the 26th through the 40th week, remember babies' gestation, the, the average gestation time period here is 40 weeks to have a baby. So from 26 weeks to 40 weeks, at that point, they, they have to do an IDX, which I mentioned earlier, intact dilation and extraction. That's an induction of labor. It's called a hysterotomy. And so it's not a hysterectomy. That's a little bit different, hysterotomy. Now, so anyway, I could go way more into this, but I won't. That's not what the object of this is. But I will say that when I studied this and literally saw videos taken of babies, uh, some babies that had saline um, solution put into the amniotic fluid, and I saw how those babies were struggling in the womb, that tells me those babies were in pain. I can't, when I started reading about the partial birth abortions, I literally started to cry and just felt sick. I felt very, very sick to think that, that in this country we could put an instrument inside a woman where there's a baby that could be born alive and that we could simply crush the skull inside the woman and then deliver the baby and it's okay. I got sick, just really sick. Now, those, granted, those are very, very rare. And most doctors would tell you those are only used in cases of women whose lives are in danger. But I've read some stories that say that they are used in other cases, sometimes just with women who don't want the baby. Now, let's talk about some of the dangers of abortion. Um, there are some possible immediate side effects, and I'm sure they tell women this when they go in. I hope they do. You could have a, a uterine puncture or wounds from the, the tools they can use. There could be infection, obviously. There could be leftover placental material. Um, you know, those are some immediate side effects. Maybe they're not very common. I don't know. There are possible later side effects. Some of those are emotional. I've talked to women who had abortions who were emotionally scarred when later they realized what they had done. I talked to some who had the mental wounds, as I'm saying, as well as physical wounds. I've also talked to ladies who were like, man, I'm glad I did it. I don't regret it a bit. So, you know, there, you can find women on both sides of the coin there. There was a study done in the 1980s, and it was done on rats. So, you know, I'm not sure. I understand a lot of the studies we do transfer from animals to humans. We do those all the time in scientific uh, labs. Well, there was one done from rats that they say could transfer to humans that argued that people with a history of abortion could have an increased risk of breast cancer. 
You know, I don't know about that. I'm not arguing that either way. Others deny that this is the case. The study showed that in early pregnancies, and this is fact here, hormone levels increase, which lead to breast enlargement to go ahead and get the mother ready to feed the baby when the baby is delivered later, much later. So the breast grows and new cells are created here. The hypothesis was that if these cells were interrupted prematurely by abortion, that what's left behind are some very immature cells. They're not just the typical breast cells that have been there. You know, they're very immature because they were newly being created. And it says that these could be exposed to carcinogens, cancer-causing agents, and hormones over time, and they wouldn't have the proper coping mechanisms built in them because they were left there prematurely. It says that mature breast cells have more time for DNA repair and have longer cell cycles. So I think you can see that they're saying with exposure to carcinogens years, years later, that the breast cells um, that were immature, that were cut off because of an abortion, could not maybe not cope as well with the carcinogens. I don't know. I can't argue that. Yay or nay. Now, let's get into what the Bible says about this. I'm just going to read you some scriptures that I believe uphold the idea of sanctity of life. That means the holiness of life, that life should be preserved. Genesis 2-7. Genesis 2-7 says, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Whew. What is it about the word when you start reading the word? I've been reading all these stats, and I didn't feel any great anointing, but man, you, you read the word and anointing just hits. This scripture shows clearly that it was God who gave life. Because I believe that God gave life, I don't believe that man can take life. Let's don't get into the death penalty. That's a whole other thing that maybe we should study soon. I understand that um, in the Old Testament, the death penalty was allowed in some cases. But here we're talking about babes in the womb. That's very different. That's an innocent life as opposed to somebody who killed somebody, you know, premeditated murder or something. This is very different. God gave life. I don't believe that man should take it in this case. Let's move on in Genesis. Genesis chapter 25. Again, Genesis 25. Some people may be looking this up, so I'll try to go slower. Genesis 25. I'm going to read two verses, 21 and 23. Isaac prayed to the Lord on behalf of his wife because she was childless. The Lord answered his prayer, and his wife, Rebekah, became pregnant. Let's stop right there. That was verse 21. That tells us here that Rebecca, who was barren, could not have children. When they prayed, God answered the prayer and gave life. That tells you God was given the life in the womb. Now let's go to verse 23. The Lord said to her, Two nations are in your womb, and two peoples from within you will be separated. One people will be stronger than the other, and the older will serve the younger. So, He's telling her. She's a pregnant woman. A pregnant woman who in modern times could have aborted those twins. Not that she would have wanted to. She wanted children. But he's telling her there's two nations in your womb. Two whole nations. You're talking Jacob and Esau in her womb. So God's talking about what we would, what a lot of people, not me, would call fetuses that could be aborted. He's talking about them not just as people, but nations. Ooh, that's big. Now let's move on. Deuteronomy 5, 17. It says very simply, Thou shalt not murder. You shall not murder. Now let me stop right there and, and maybe cause another controversy here, even with some of my Christian friends who are pro-life, except in cases of rape or incest, something like that. I am not for abortion in any case uh don't please don't get mad at me i love you i hope you love me do two wrongs make a right how can we say that this is not murder if a girl's been raped or how can we say that that taking away the baby's life is not murder just because it was incest or something else those are horrible things i can't i don't even want to think about a young person having to go through this but does that make it right still to kill the baby I have a, a friend, we used to be really good friends, haven't seen her in a long time though, we don't live near each other, and she uh, was raped 
at age 13, 12 or 13. And she gave birth to the baby because her family, as a Christian family, didn't believe in abortion. And she now is, um, I'm going to say my friend is probably in her late 40s now. And she's very, very close to that daughter. You know, they're only about 13 years apart. She did not raise the child. They gave the child up for adoption, but she's very close to that daughter. She doesn't regret have she regrets the rape. She doesn't regret that she had that child. I could tell you many, many other stories like that, but we, we won't go there right now. Now, here's an interesting scripture. Exodus 21, verses 22 through 24. Again, Exodus 21, 22 through 24. And I've put this in a version other than the King James so you could understand it better. If people are fighting and hit a pregnant woman and she gives birth prematurely, but there is no serious injury, the offender must be fined whatever the woman's husband demands and the court allows. But if there is serious injury, you are to take life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot. It goes on and on. Um, so here there was a, an issue that was raised that if two men are fighting or two people are fighting and they hit a pregnant woman and she gives birth and there's, there's damage there, then it says there's a price to be paid. So even in the Bible, that life in the womb was considered a life. And that's the case in America now in a lot of states. I really don't know the law um, in the U.S. overall about this. But a lot of times if there's a pregnant woman and she is killed, it's called a double homicide if she's murdered. A double homicide because they consider the baby within her to be a life as well. Well, that's, that's ironic. That's paradoxical. To say that we can say there's a double homicide, the mother's life and the baby's life, and then say, but she could have aborted that baby and it wouldn't have been murder. So really what we come down to here is, is the child wanted or not? Because if that pregnant mother was killed and that she, was, she had planned to have the baby, we consider it murder. But then if a woman doesn't want to have a baby and she does away with it, we consider it okay. That seems to be a double standard here. Now, let's keep going here. Proverbs chapter 6, Proverbs 6, verses 16 and 17. There are six things the Lord hates. Now, that word is a strong word. There are six things the Lord hates, seven that are detestable to him. Now, I'm going to skip all of them and get to the one that says this in verse 17. Hands that shed innocent blood. No doubt. That baby in the womb is innocent, hasn't had a chance to come out into life to do anything wrong. So it says there are six things the Lord hates, seven that are detestable to him. And one of those things is hands that shed innocent blood. That is a troubling, troubling scripture. Now, let's go to Isaiah 44, 2. Isaiah 44, 2. This is what the Lord says. He who made you who formed you in the womb, and who will help you. Isaiah is saying clearly here, God is the one who made you, who formed you in the womb. So are we saying that, that we have the right to take something that God is forming in a woman's womb and, and kill it? Aren't we going against what God is doing there? Isaiah 49 Isaiah 49, I'm going to read two verses, starting with one, and then I'll skip to five. Verse one says this, Before I was born, the Lord called me. From my mother's womb, he has spoken my name. Go to verse five. He who formed me in the womb to be his servant. He who formed me in the womb to be his servant. This is the prophet Isaiah. We have a book of the Bible named after him. Be this, this man was huge, a hugely important prophet. And he says that while he was still in the womb, God had already, oh, hallelujah, called and formed him to be a prophet. Who knows what, what babies have been aborted that could have had great futures, could have had amazing lives to change the world, but we'll never know because it, it was taken before they had that chance. I read a story one time, true story, about Abraham Lincoln's mother, that if you looked at what was going on with her when she was pregnant with him, you would have absolutely said in modern times, if you were pro-choice, let's say, 
you would say, oh, she should do away with that baby because it's not going to have a good life. She's not in any position to raise a baby. She's too young. Her, she's in poverty. She birthed Abraham Lincoln. Whew. How can we judge whether that child in the womb is going to be able to have a good life, be taken care of? When I said that, I'm going to stop right now and I want to say something. I, um... Hang on, I lost my picture there for a minute. I don't know what happened to it. I have a problem that a lot of people lump anti-abortion people. A lot of the people who are pro-choice lump the pro-life people into one big basket and say, well, all you people, you all you care about is that you protect that life of that baby, but once that baby's born, you don't do anything to help it. You don't care if the one mother's in poverty. You don't care if that child doesn't have good food or a good place to live. I think that that is true for some people, perhaps. But it's not true of me. And it's not true of the majority of my friends that I know who are anti-abortion. They, they want to help take care of children after they're born. They want to help take care of that mother. I have a heart to take care of a mother who goes ahead to have that baby. Whether it be poverty, to help her get out of poverty or take care of her while she's in it till she can get out. To help her finish her education. Or perhaps that child needs to be adopted to help with these issues. So please, if you are um, on, on a liberal side of abortion, please don't look at all conservatives when it comes to this issue and think that they all just say, yeah, don't kill that baby, but don't take care of it once it's born. We're not, we're not heartless, all of us. I hope nobody is, but I know I'm not heartless. All right, let's continue with the scripture. I'm going to continue with um, some of the prophets who tell you plainly that in the womb, that is a living soul. Jeremiah chapter 1, very famous scripture. Jeremiah chapter 1, I think I'm going to start here with verse 4. It says, I think on my paper it says 4 through 10. I actually don't have all of that there, but you can read it. It all pertains. Before I formed you in the womb... I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. Now, who's talking here? It's God. Jeremiah wrote it down, but this is what he heard God say to him. God said, before I formed you, Jeremiah, in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. That means made him holy, consecrated him. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. I have no doubt that when I was in my mother's womb, Judy Bray carried me in her womb. She was only 18 years old. And she was going to become a mother shortly, you know, after turning 19, about a half a year after turning 19. A lot of people would have thought she was, you know, too young to, to care for me. They didn't have a lot of money, lived in a teeny little 35-foot-long mobile home. And, uh, they just didn't have hardly anything. But my mother gave birth to me, and I have no doubt that when I was in my mother's womb, already God had set me apart to, as for this calling that he's put on my life to minister. Already, that was in me, in my mother's womb. So who are we to, to think about an unborn child to say, well, that one's probably not going to have any great purpose to fulfill. But, you know, Leslie and her mother's womb, we'll let her live. We can't judge that. God judges that. Hmm. Hang on a second. I want to make sure I haven't had any comments. Yeah, I'm good so far. I've had a few. Thank you, Janet. That's sweet what you said. Thank you, Kaylin. You shared it. I appreciate that. Okay, let's keep going with Scripture. Job. Let's move on to Job. 10.8. Your hands shaped me and made me. Job speaking to God. He said, your hands shaped me, made me. Job 31.15. Did not he that made me in the womb make him? And did not one fashion us in the womb? You had all these scriptures saying that God was fashioning that young life in the womb. Psalm 119, verse 73. 119:73, Your hands made me and formed me. Again, talking to God. Your hands made me, formed me. This next one I love. Oh, I love them all, but this one just gets me. Psalm 139. Psalm 139, starting with verse 13. I'll read through 16. Speaking to God here. For you created my inmost being. 
you knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Now let's skip on to, let's skip to verse 15. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place. When I was woven together in the depths of the earth, your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. Oh my goodness. God created us in the secret places. A lot of times when you see something here talking about when I was woven together in the depths of the earth, that can apply to the womb, like the secret place, the depths of the womb. Whew. God did it. He created us. Ecclesiastes 11.5 As you do not know the path of the wind or how the body is formed in a mother's womb, so you cannot understand the work of God, the maker of all things. If you believe that God gives life, how can you rationalize you making the choice to take that life? Are we saying that we know better than God? Now, I know there are people who don't believe that God gave life. They believe that it was just biologically, this is what happened. But I'm showing you here that if you go with a Bible translation of this, God did give life. Now, oh, let's go to the New Testament just a minute because you might be saying, well, that's just Old Testament. We're living in the New Testament now. Things are different. No, they're not. Luke chapter 1, verse 15. This is speaking of John the Baptist. John the Baptist who prepared the way for Jesus. It says, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He is never to take wine or other fermented drink and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even before for he is born he will be filled with the holy spirit even before he is born john the baptist filled with the holy ghost in his mother's womb are we saying he's an exception we shouldn't have aborted him because of that well, how, how do we know how do we know what's going on with that child in somebody's womb all right that's the end of the first two pages. It's 741. We're doing great here. 830. I know some of y'all want to see Justin Timberlake, Bon Jovi. I will watch that as well. So let's go to page three, which at the top says ancient child sacrifice. Now, we would say that this is ancient history and we would never do this now, not in civilized countries. That ancient child sacrifice was usually for a vow to a deity, you know, a god, not the god, but a god. There aren't any other living gods, but that's what they believed. And also, they would sometimes sacrifice their children to gain favor from their god, not our god. Or they would sometimes sacrifice their child to replace, they would hope they could get a, a replacement for the defective child. Like they would literally sacrifice a, detect, a defective child so they could get a, one that was whole. That's disturbing. There's an inscription at Carthage, which is an ancient, you know, um, where is Carthage? Somebody type on there. Megan, somebody Google. Tell me where Carthage is. There's an inscription at Car Carthage that says this. It was from uh, Tuscus, and I'm not sure who Tuscus was, but he, in the inscription, says that he gave Baal, which was his god, false god, he gave Baal his mute son, Bodistart, a defective child in exchange for a healthy one. Now, we've translated this into English, but in their language, it was saying that this person, Tuscus, was giving Baal his son, Bodistart, who was mute, couldn't speak, and he was defective. So he sacrificed his child to the God he believed in in hopes that he could get a, a healthy one. Usually in Bible terms, when you go back to Bible days, there was a lot of child sacrifice going on. Yes, even God's chosen people, the Jews, did it sometimes. Usually these children were sacrificed to somebody, a false god, called Molech, which in the language of that time meant king. So he was a god. He was an Ammonite god, actually. They also sometimes sacrificed their children to the, the false god Baal that I mentioned earlier. But, but biblically... A lot of times it speaks of Molech. And I'll give you some, uh, thank you, Dylan, awesome. Carthage is in northern Africa. Thank you so much. 
Uh, so Carthage, Northern Africa, from that inscription I read to you earlier from Tuscus. Now let's go to Leviticus chapter 20, 1 through 5. Leviticus 21 through 5. The Lord said to Moses, Say to the Israelites, Any Israelite or any foreigner residing in Israel who sacrifices any of his children to Molech is to be put to death. The members of the community are to stone him. I myself will set my face against him and will cut him off from his people. For by sacrificing his children to Molech, he has defiled my sanctuary and profaned my holy name. If the members of the community close their eyes when that man sacrifices one of his children to Molech, and if they fail to put him to death, I myself will set my face against him and his family and will cut them off from their people together with all who follow him in prostituting themselves to Molech. There are many other scriptures in the law, that's the, uh, the law of Moses, as we call it, that say something similar to this about you do not sacrifice your children to that false god. Don't sacrifice your children to any god, basically. Deuteronomy 12.31. Deuteronomy 12.31. You must not worship the Lord your God in their way. He's talking about the heathen peoples. He's telling his chosen people, you must not worship the Lord God in your God in their way. Because in worshiping their gods, they do all kinds of detestable things the Lord hates. They even burn their sons and daughters in the fire as sacrifices to their gods. And the final one I'm going to read here about ancient child sacrifice is Jeremiah 19, 4 through 6. Jeremiah 19, verses 4 through 6. For they have forsaken me and made this a place of foreign gods. They have filled this place with the blood of the innocent. They have built the high places of Baal to burn their children in the fire as offerings to Baal, something I did not command or mention, nor did it enter my mind. So beware. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when people will no longer call this place Topheth, or the Valley of Ben-Hinnom, but the Valley of Slaughter. So there was a place here where God's people, the Jews, the ancient Israelites, I guess you should call them, were sacrificing their children to pagan gods for favor you know maybe you know send us good weather i don't know send us good crops we'll sacrifice our child to you if you'll do that so you say well what does that have to do with people today because we would never do that we would never take our children and put them burn them in the fire and kill them before our eyes so that some false god would be appeased in a sense we are still sacrificing our children I'm going to get more into that later. But the firstborn was always very special and precious, biblically speaking. I think all children are precious. I got five in my last one. My fifth one was is just as precious as that first one. But in the Bible, the firstborn held a very sacred place. The, anything that was firstborn was specially dedicated to God. That included animals. You would offer, you would sacrifice a lot of times a firstborn animal because that was the special one. Whatever was the first to open the womb was considered holy and, and devoted to the Lord. To be offered to the Lord, not as a sacrifice. But do you see that how now when you're talking about the fact that, and I think this used to be the case more than today, but if you're talking about the fact that a lot of times the children that are aborted in this country would have been the firstborn. We're taking the firstborn to open the womb and, and we're sacrificing those children, not to any uh, God that we can name, not Baal or Molech, but maybe we're putting them on the altar of, of our convenience or to save us pain. Most of the girls that I knew, my friends in high school, close friends who got these abortions, a lot of times it was because it was total fear. If my mom and daddy found out I'm pregnant, they're going to kill me. They're going to throw me out of the house. It's going to be terrible. And it, that might have happened, actually. And I actually had um, some friends in high school who had abortions because their parents found out they were pregnant and said, you're getting an abortion. Taking you right now to the clinic. We're doing this, you know. So uh, a lot of times it was that fear of, I'm going to be in huge trouble. In other words, we're putting that in front of a human life. Which, I, man, my heart goes out to these girls, to my friends who went through this. But we won't go into that right now. We will at the end here. Just a few other notes on abortion. Pr 
pro-choice advocates, as I said earlier, tend to use the word fetus for the unborn in the womb. Pro-life advocates usually use baby, infant baby. Uh, in the Bible, it's always referred to as baby, child, or infant in the womb, not, not something that has no life. Make sure there's no more comments before I hate, I would hate to miss some. Okay. Another thing about abortion, uh, the child sacrifice and the abortion parallels that I mentioned earlier, the pagan child sacrifices in ancient times often involved putting the child into fire, burning the child. I think it's very sadly ironic that in saline abortions, the dying infants are chemically burned by the saline and, uh, and they do thrash about often for at least minutes, sometimes hours. There have been cases of, of babies in the womb with saline abortions. When that harsh chemical is put into the amnio fluid here, the babies thrash, the pain of it, and it, it feels like fire. That's, oh, that's troubling to me. Another thing when you talk about the child sacrifice and abortion parallels, a lot of times in ancient civilizations, it was thought to be okay to sacrifice your defective child, I said that earlier, to the pagan god in hopes that you could get a better child, a whole child. Well, today we have uh, procedures, amniocentesis, for example, uh, that is the standard medical procedure to detect congenital abnormalities and to give the parents the choice of terminating the pregnancy, possibly. Well, isn't that very similar as, as what these people were doing in ancient times to say, if I'm going to have a defective child, I think I'll go ahead and do away with that one so that I could go on and have a healthy child. I have friends who've done this too. And again, I'm not, I don't feel any judgment toward anybody. I'm just hoping to shed what I feel is Bible truth on this, that maybe somebody's heart will be changed. I have a dear friend, and I would never name any of these people. I have a dear friend who um, got pregnant and wanted the baby, very much wanted the baby. But she was middle-aged, or, or getting close to middle age, you could say. And they did an amniocentesis on her and told her that the child had some severe abnormalities. And they gave her the option to abort the child. She came to me, came into my house to my living room, devastated, and said, what do I do? What do I do? I said, well, my advice is, no, you do not abort that child. Even if they're telling you there's horrible things wrong, don't, that, is that, does that give you the right to kill the child? But... You know, she could go on and do what she wanted. Well, she chose not to abort the child. And do you know that that child today is a healthy and whole person? Um, I think he's in his 20s now, doing great, ended up being an athlete. Just there was nothing wrong. So that was that was a mistake. What a, a faulty amnio uh, scan or not a scan. I guess they actually take the fluid and find these things out. But what if she had aborted that child? Now, granted, she would have never known that he was going to grow up to be just totally whole. But that, that's, um, that's something to think about. And then the final note that I have when I'm talking here about the pagan child sacrifices is I told you earlier, usually in ancient times, it was all about worship of a, a pagan god. Are we, are we doing the same? Could it be that modern people worship ourselves? Anything can be a God. Money can be a God. My husband can be a God. My children can be a God. If I put them in front of the one and only God, could it be that we value our convenience and all of these other things more than we value that human life that's growing inside of us? Have we made ourselves a God? Now, I have some other dear friends who have said that they've been told if they ever have children, any more children, that they'll probably die. You know, I, I, still, I still can't condone taking a life. You know, in that case, I, I think the person would try to not become pregnant. But if they did, I still can't condone taking a life. I have to tell you truthfully that if I were to get pregnant now, boy, that would be a miracle at my age, but I'd love it. 
if I were to get pregnant and they told me, oh, Leslie, at your age and all these things are wrong, you're not going to live through this. Even if they told me 100% I'm not going to live through it, I can't kill that baby. I'm going to have to have that baby and trust God to do a miracle, to give me a miracle of life. I still believe in the God of miracles. Whew. This is a subject that is... is it, it upsets me, to be honest with you. It doesn't make me uh, mad at anybody who's had an abortion. It upsets me to think what we're doing without sometimes even thinking. Another note on abortion, some of the ironies of it. We put warnings on cigarettes. I, I, I read that they put warnings on alcohol labels. I don't know. I got a bottle of wine in there that somebody gave me for Christmas 10 years ago. I don't drink, so it's still sitting in there. I should have checked to see if there's a warning on that label. We put warnings about for unborn children on cigarettes and alcohol to say these could damage unborn children. So we care enough about them to put that on labels. I've already mentioned that we could charge somebody who kills a pregnant woman with a double homicide, the irony of that. And this is one I didn't mention earlier. There is a law that can delay a death sentence imposed against a pregnant woman who is guilty of a crime until after she delivers the baby. This was the law. This was a few years back. I didn't study it for today, but uh, I think this was 2015. In 21 states, this was the law that if there's a pregnant woman who's guilty of a crime and she is sentenced to death, that they can't kill her till after she delivers the baby or they would be killing a baby too. Again, there's the irony. Now, granted, there aren't a lot of uh, executions these days of, of women on death row, but this was a law on the books just in case. All right, I'm at the final part of this, the final paper, and it is 7.55, so you'll be able to go to the inauguration event shortly if you want to do that. Here are some quotes on abortion. This one comes from Dr. Bernard Nathanson, M.D. He was a former abortion. He is a former abortionist. I've read his story. It's amazing. This man did many, many abortions. He said fewer women would have abortions if wombs had windows. I'm going to read that again. Fewer women would have abortions if wombs had windows. If pregnant women could see into that womb, and sonogram helps us do that now. Sonograms are amazing now with the dimensions they can give you, the picture. If you could see that little baby sucking the thumb inside the womb, which a lot of them do. If you could see the baby smile in the womb, which some of them have been captured with photos through sonograms doing that. If you could see that and see the little baby moving around and getting a comfortable position, I think he's right. I think there would be fewer abortions. There are states that have laws in place that say that, um, so that sonograms ultrasound is required before an abortion to show the mother that yes this baby inside you is moving there's a heartbeat it's it's breathing it's moving or you know not breathing like us you know what i mean inside the amniotic fluid i think a lot of times people who've never studied this or really thought about the things i've taught you tonight when they find out they're pregnant it's it's unseen and especially in the early days before they can feel the baby move you know, it's just, it's kind of out of sight, out of mind. They can't see it. I think it's a very different story when you see it, when the ultrasound brings the picture to you and you see it, and suddenly you realize, wow, that is, and that's another life. And I understand the term pro-choice doesn't mean you're pro-abortion. I, I totally get that. For example, if I'm not mistaken, I hope I've got this right, I think President Biden, who was sworn in today, I think he is not pro-abortion, but pro-choice. I could have that wrong. I'm not sure. But a lot of people don't like abortion and would never have one in any case. But they think other women should have the choice to decide. You know, that reproductive freedom of choice. But here's the thing. If we consider, and the law often does, considers that baby another life, still, does a woman have a choice to take another life? Yes, that baby's going to affect her life, but it's not her life. It's another life. It's a separate life. So when we talk about freedom of choice, 
And you say, well, who am I to tell another woman that, you know, she can't have an abortion if that's what she feels like she needs to do? Well, okay, if your husband's just making your life miserable and you feel like you're going to die if you have to continue living with this man and you kill him, can you use the defense to say that, well, you know, he's making my life miserable and I'm bound to him by law, so I did away with him? You know, we call something like that murder. Or, or would you take a woman who's had a child and that child's two or three years old and the child's making life miserable. Maybe the child is in some way, um, has a uh, physical disadvantage, challenged, physically challenged, or mentally challenged. What if you have a child like that and it's the woman feels her life is miserable and she feels like she's going to die if she has to live another day like this? Should she be able to take that child's life then when the child is two or three? It's... It's not really different to me. I understand some people see that differently. We would put that woman, if she killed her three-year-old, we put her in jail. But if she kills her three-week-old or her three-months-inside-the-womb-old baby, it's, it's okay. I don't see that. It's paradoxical. The former Surgeon General, Dr. C. Everett Koop, said this. We now know when life begins because the test tube baby proves that life begins with conception. What do you have in the dish? An egg and a sperm. What do you add to it to get a baby? Nothing. Life begins at conception. There was a professor, Paul Mosca. I'm not sure if he's still alive or not. He was the Associate Professor Emeritus at the University of British Columbia. He did a doctoral dissertation on pagan child sacrifice and this is what he said how could a culture so well developed morally intellectually and materially tolerate so abominable a custom how could a sophisticated people sanction what seems to be such a barbaric practice for so long a time how at the most visceral and critical level could human parents bring about the destruction of their own child. And now I'm going to read the final quote from Edmund Burke, who was an 18th century Irish statement, statesman and philosopher. It wasn't specifically about abortion, but I think it applies. The only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men to do nothing. I'm going to say it again. The only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men to do nothing. Now, do I think all of these uh, women who've had abortions or grandparents who make their daughter have an abortion or husbands or boyfriends who say, you're going to get an abortion or else, do I think that they're evil? I don't think necessarily those people are evil. I think they're, they're just uh, moving a lot of times out of fear or pain, discomfort. I think what happens is evil. I think murder is, is always evil. That doesn't mean I'm saying that if you've had an abortion, I think you're an evil person. And what I want to say to you, I wish, you know, I doubt my friends who, my many friends who've had abortions, I, I doubt any of them are watching. I don't even think they're on Facebook, actually. I want to say these scriptures of comfort. Now, you may be one of those who says, I had abortions and I don't regret it. I'm glad I did. It would have made my life miserable when I was 15. Or I had a friend who was actually 14, 14 or 15 when she got pregnant. And her, her mother took her to get the abortion. You know, um, maybe, maybe you're one of those who thinks, I'm glad I did it. But maybe you're not. Maybe you're one of those and you've never told anybody you had an abortion. And you know what? You don't have to. You don't have to come to me, or you don't have to go to a priest, or you don't have to tell your husband or your kids or anybody that you had an abortion. That's between you and God. God already knows it. You don't have to go confess to somebody. Maybe you're somebody who's had an abortion, and maybe you're somebody who still feels the guilt of that. I want to help you with that right now. 1 John 1 9. This is New Testament stuff here, it's powerful. 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If 
we confess our sins, he's faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. So if you're somebody, with, and maybe you're a, a guy, and you agreed for your girlfriend or your wife to have an abortion, and maybe you still feel that guilt, have, all you got to do is confess that sin to God. He already knows it, but there's something about us confessing it to him. It shows a humility on our part, and it shows a recognition that we know what we did. So if you say, God, I am so sorry. You know, I'm, I'm going to be hypothetical here. I have not had an abortion. I told you earlier, if I had somehow ended up pregnant as a teenager, I probably would have. I didn't know anything about abortion. I didn't know even it was, nobody talked about it, that it was wrong. But I'm telling you that I'm going to pray hypothetically for, let's say it was one of you, that you could say something like, God, I am so sorry. You know, I aborted this child. I was a teenager. I didn't know any better or or your mama made me do it, or, or my boyfriend made me do it, or my girlfriend went on and did it, and I was complicit in it. I drove her there or something. I am so sorry. I confess to you that I did this, and I am so sorry. And I ask you, God, to forgive me in the name of Jesus. That is how simple it is to ask for forgiveness. Confess your sin. Ask him to forgive you, and he has promised he will. Now, here's what I'm going to say to some of y'all. You need to receive that forgiveness. A lot of people ask forgiveness, and then they keep doing it over and over and over. They go through years of their lives feeling guilty for something they did 30 years ago, and they keep repenting for it over and over and over. And it's just, when you repent, it's over. It's done. It doesn't right the wrong, but it takes away your sin in it. So I think the reason a lot of people just keep repenting over and over and over and over for sins they committed long ago is the fact that they never received that forgiveness from God. So after you pray and you ask for that forgiveness, here's what I do. I repent every day, whether it was impatience with my children or whatever it was, talking about somebody and I shouldn't have. I repent every night before I go to bed. And then after I repent, I confess my sin and I ask God to forgive me and show me other sins I didn't think of. I literally stretch my hands out like this and I say, I receive your forgiveness and I thank you for it, Lord. And when you receive that forgiveness, know that it's done. I just read you in 1 John 1, 9. It says, He is faithful and just. He will forgive your sins and purify you. Did you hear that? He will purify us from all unrighteousness. It means now you're purified. You've been made righteous by the blood of Christ. Now, Psalm 103, 12. Psalm 103, 12. Very comforting. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. Transgressions, that's your sins. So when, when you've repented of your sins, as far as the east is from the west, you can't get there. You know, because once you get to the west, it's west again. And once you get, as far as the east is from the west, that's how far he has removed our sins from us. When we repent and receive his forgiveness, they're gone. You can't ever get their whole oh, hallelujah. You can't ever get them anymore. They're gone. He forgets them. We keep remembering our sins over and over and over, and it'll torment us if we don't receive his forgiveness. So if you are somebody who perhaps had had a part in an abortion, whether it was you or somebody you knew, maybe you drove them to the clinic or something, you feel bad about it, repent to God. Confess it. Repent to God. Receive his forgiveness. And then move on into the future and know you're purified from that sin. That's, the all, that's all that I have on the paperwork. That's four pages worth, back and front, three and a half technically. That's all I have. Um, I don't know if there's anybody that wants to say something in the comments, uh, but feel free to. If you disagree with me, I'm not mad at you. Um, I don't hate you. I love you. If we disagree on this subject, I know, again, it's a very, very touchy topic right now. Biblically, I believe that murdering an unborn child is wrong. I think, I know you say, well, don't use that word murder. We're just talking about, you know, doing away with an unborn child. I still consider doing away with murder. So I do think biblically it's not the correct thing to do. I think, I do think 
that people who are anti-abortion, pro-life we call it, I do think we need to do more to help the women that we say, you got to have this baby. And then we need to do something to help them. Maybe we Christians should start looking more into adoption. I read a statistic or heard a statistic recently that if only one family, one family in every church in America would, uh, would adopt one of the children in foster care right now, there would be no more children in foster care. There'd be no more need right now at this time for a foster care system if every only one. It's talking about one family. Now, my church is little. So, you know, you're talking probably one in 10 or 15 families. But some of these great big churches with 200 families, surely there's one family that can adopt a child out of foster care. One family adopt a child out of foster care in every church in America, and the foster system at this point would be emptied out. Now, abortion, we got a whole different situation because a lot, a lot of children are being killed before they're born. Well, then we need to do something. We, we, if we tell them they got to put them up for adoption, maybe it's we Christians who are supposed to start adopting them. I want to adopt children. I got five. And I got, you know, the kids I have now are like, go for it, Mom, if you feel it. But your life is so busy, could you give that kid justice, a baby justice? I, I don't know, but I'm praying about it. If I had my druthers, as my daddy used to say, I'd open up an orphanage in Walnut Cove, and I'd, I'd or not open an orphanage, I'd find a way to adopt all the kids I could. And I, I would want to love them and bring them up in the ways of the Lord. So if we're going to sit back and say, stop abortion now, Supreme Court, come on, stop abortion now, somebody take a case there and let's overturn Roe v. Wade, well, you, we're going to have to have a solution to what we're going to do with all these women now that we've told that they have to have their babies. Do I believe that they should have their babies? Absolutely. But there are things we can do to help them have the babies and to give the babies and the mothers a new life. Whew. Thank you, God. God has a way. But anyway, that's all I want to say. I don't see any um, questions or anything. I'm not an expert on this, but I think my Bible sources are pretty pretty settled in my heart anyway that that's what the Bible says. I love you. Feel free to talk to me about this. And before I turn it off, and we can still talk later through the comments, before I turn it off, I want to say this. If you are somebody who needs to talk to somebody about a previous abortion you had or an experience you had with somebody who had an abortion, if you need somebody to talk to, please let me know. Privacy. I'll talk to you privately. Nobody will ever know that you came to me to talk about this subject. And I'll be glad to pray over you. I want to help the women who've been through this, who feel, you know, that, that it was wrong. They feel a guilt somehow. I want to help them. I love you all so much. Thank you for tuning in. God's got a plan, and it's a good plan for every life. Talk to me in the comments if you want to say something. I'm going to figure out how to turn this off in live video. Again, I love you.